recording session. And we are very happy that Ira Rothstein um, agreed to give a lecture on effective field theories. Um, and yeah, as you know, I, I, I would like to ask you to save your questions for, for the discussion session next. Wednesday. So please don't ask questions and keep um, muted while recording. And is there anything else? I guess that's it. So Ira, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for uh, inviting me to speak. I'm happy to be here. I wish I could be there, but maybe next time. Um, so I've been asked to speak about effective field theories. Um, oh, uh, uh, sorry. So on the Slack channel, I uploaded um, a set of lecture notes. Um, there actually will be another set of lecture notes for the uh, that I'll upload later that will cover the topics in the set in the uh, second recording of a, a lecture. Um, so uh, I will only be touching upon. Uh, parts of the lecture notes and the problems, the exercises are in the lecture notes. Uh, there's probably more exercises than you uh, probably have time for. Um, most of them, I think, hopefully will be relatively straightforward uh, and are there to help you um, fill in the gaps of uh, not only what's in uh, the recorded lectures, but also in the notes themselves because um, especially in the recorded lectures, I only have um, two 90-minute sessions, and uh, this is a very large topic. So um, let's get started. Um, so um, let's first uh, review exactly what effective field theory is. Obviously, I don't have time to go through this in much detail. I hope some of you or most of you have had some introduction uh, to effective field theories. I know you all probably have taken field theory. Um, how much you've learned about effective field theory probably depends upon um, the individual. Uh, so I will only have a very short period of time to give a very rudimentary introduction to effective field theory. But um, the goal of these lectures will eventually to use effective field theory uh, in a context where you can utilize scattering amplitudes. So in particular, um, a very um, topical subject these days is using scattering amplitudes to calculate um, uh, gravitational wave signals from binary in spirals. So uh, this is an application of scattering amplitudes which has um, immediate phenomenological consequences. So my goal will be to first give you a brief introduction to effective field theories, and then um, we'll start off uh, in a direction of applying uh, scattering amplitudes to calculate uh, uh, signatures from binary in spirals uh, by the end of the second lecture. Okay, so um, what is an effective field theory? Well, first of all, uh, um, and effective field theories are a subset of quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is, of course, the ultimate um, tool to describe uh, nature. Um, it's often overkill. You don't need quantum field theory to study non-ultivistic hydrogen, uh, although that's not completely true uh, um, in the sense that you may want to calculate, say, the lamp shift or other field theoretic corrections. But in, in any case, um, uh, um, in general, you know, having power over field theory is power over most subjects in, uh, in physics, certainly, and in chemistry, to some extent, depending on what you're looking at. Um, so um, not all quantum field theories are effective field theories. So effective field theory we're going to find as a quantum field theory, which has a limited range of validity. Which is um, a, a little bit of a uh, of a um, of a misrepresentation in the sense that it sounds like defining it as a negative, where it's actually a positive, because in general quantum field theories are too difficult to solve 
uh, analytically. And in fact, the field theory is a tool which allows you to solve um, uh, or approximate, I should say, quantum field theories in some special circumstances with some expansion parameter. In other words, if you have a, a field theory that may not even be weakly coupled, however, if you can find some other expansion parameter uh, in some kinematic limit or some special situation where there are other scales in the problem, then, um, then you can start attacking it analytically. Um, so effective field theories are really um, uh, um, a corner, or not, I shouldn't say a corner, because uh, it makes it seem like it's it's um, not generic, but um, uh, a set of quantum field theories for which there is a well-defined expansion parameter, usually in terms of, of ratios of scales, for which allows you to parse the problem and simplify it. So it's a really a divide and conquer strategy, as you'll see. <coughs> so what what I mean by a limited range of validity. Typically, is it's not there's some UV scale at which it's um, so for K less than some UV we usually cut a cutoff. Uh, the theory is valid, and above that UV scale, it's not. So a field theory which is valid to all scales is is often called the UV complete theory. And a UV complete theory um, uh, from an, a renormalization group point of view flows, must flow to a conformal field theory in, uh, in the UV in the sense that there are finite, for those, I think those of you who are familiar with this nomenclature, for those of you who are not, uh, it's not relevant, it won't be important for the rest of this talk, but it flows to a fixed point where there's a finite number of marginal and relevant parameters. Um, but uh, a, a, a theory being mathematically consistent in the UV doesn't mean it describes nature in the UV. So for instance, QCD is a UV complete theory, but we know it doesn't describe nature at all scales. So even though it by itself is mathematically consistent uh, and predictive, uh, at least in principle, um, it is not, uh, it is UV complete mathematically, but not UV complete physically in the sense that even at the electroweak scale, we know you get the Z and the W boson and you must include them in the theory if you wish to, to describe the physics properly. And of course, we also know that uh, once you hit uh, the Planck scale, um, <clears throat> Einstein gravity uh, no longer uh, is predictive and it's not UV complete. So we don't really have a UV complete quantum field theoretic description of nature. Um, it's believed perhaps that um, above the Planck scale, of course, you have string theory, which is not a quantum field theory um, that describes um, uh, the complete theory. But um, for most purposes, for phenomenological purposes, um, every theory is an effective field theory. Right? Um, so it's a pretty broad class of theories. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we obviously don't have time to go over um, the complete gamut of them. So um, we will just choose this one example for our lectures. OK. So <clears throat> from a phenomenological aspect, so effective field theories are mathematical necessity in some sense, but also they're phenomenological necessity. Um, in that um, they allow you to calculate in a systematic fashion. So for instance, um, we know that in perturbation theory at least, and even non-perturbatively, we can sum large logs. So if you have a theory with multiple scales, lambda one, lambda two, we say lambda two is much, much greater than lambda one, then in perturbation theory, you'll get some contributions that go like some couplings, as you know, uh, with logs. And um, in the limit where this hierarchy becomes large, what you thought was weak coupling becomes strong coupling, and you need to resum, you need to reorganize the theory in order to maintain predictive power. 
Um, furthermore, it makes calculations simpler because um, in particular, if you're doing quantum field theory, we will talk discussing effective field theory in the context of classical field theory. But in quantum field theory, we know um, that we get loop integrals, which can become quite complex. It's true, actually, I should say, even in classically, we'll see we'll get loop integrals, um, which can become quite complex. And if we have some scalar integral, which is a function of multiple scales, then this can be quite complicated, some um, hypergeometric function. But if we reduce it to one scale, then it just becomes a log. Okay. And when we work with effective field theories, what we will do is divide and conquer. We'll treat one scale at a time. So that whenever you have an integral to do, it will have a minimal number of scales, usually only one. So effective field theory integrals are much easier to do than full theory integrals. And when we discuss scattering amplitudes in the context of, of um, the binary in spiral, uh, we'll, see, we'll see how that happens. Now, um, uh, from a bigger picture, from a philosophical point of view, you could ask um, why are effective field theories possible? In other words, <clears throat> um, how is it that it's possible that we can describe all the IR physics without knowing the UV physics? So um, we said before that some theories aren't valid at some scales, at some lambda. And so if we don't know the physics above that lambda, then why is it that we can still make predictions? So why is it that science is possible? After all, we don't need to know atomic physics to understand why a block slides down a plane, right? Newton didn't know anything about atomic physics. So how is it that he got the answer right? And the answer is, is because there's UV IR factorization. That is um, all the UV physics can be encapsulated in a finite number of coefficients in some effective field theory. Of course, that's not the way um, Newton thought about it, and he didn't know. But look, to calculate the block sliding down the plane, all you really know, need to know is the mass, and maybe you need a friction coefficient. You just need a few numbers. So all the ultraviolet physics of a block sliding down a plane are encapsulated in those, those few coefficients which is the essence of effective field theory. So the question is, why did that have to be true? So what, what is it about the fundamental laws of nature that allow one to completely encapsulate the ultraviolet physics by just a few parameters? And um, the answer is, uh, as a consequence of locality, um, the underlying physics must be local, uh, at least at some scale. So I have to define what locality means. Now, what's kind of interesting is, is that if you pick up field theory books, um, you may get a different definition. In fact, you can go online and try to find a definition of locality. Um, I've done some multiple times and I could find multiple definitions. So um, it really is sort of a vaguely defined concept. Although um, uh, if, there's an old book on field theory by Hogg, which is considered uh, um, a classic um, in, in the development of field theory. Um, and the title of the, of the book is Local Quantum Fields, I believe. Um, and so Hogg defines locality um, as given to operators they will always commute outside the light cone, okay? So um, this is also sometimes called microcausality. Um, uh, as opposed to locality. And in fact, in other textbooks, you'll You'll, you'll, uh, you'll see that definition, this commutator is the definition of microcausality. Microcausality, of course, uh, here is a much clearer um, description because it means that if you have some measurement at X and some measurement at Y and they're connected, they're outside the light cone, they're causally disconnected, then they have to commute. Doesn't matter uh, which is performed first. 
there could be no transmission of information from one to the other. But clearly this can't be um, the reason, this commutator can't be the, re the ultimate reason why um, uh, 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 Newton could describe a block going down a plane, which is a completely non-relativistic problem. So even if you didn't know about relativistic physics, but you did know about atomic physics, you'd say you live in a, in an in a non-relativistic world where there are atoms and uh, clearly microcausality, since there is no notion of causality in non-relativistic physics, this, won't, this can't explain the conundrum. So um, instead, um, I'm gonna give a different definition of locality. I'm gonna define a local theory as one which where the action is the integral of some local density with some, uh, so local density meaning it's a some polynomial in the field and its derivatives, okay? Um, now this is not nearly a uh, mathematically rigorous way of defining locality, um, mainly because um, in any system, uh, we have to remember that the fields or the coordinates or whatever are just dummies indices or dummy variables. They have really no physical significance, right? I could always change coordinates. I could always change field variables. So it's possible that I could hand you an action which cannot be written this way. And you could perform a field redefinition and make it look that way. So if I gave you something which didn't look local, it would not necessarily mean it wasn't local. But if I gave you something which was local, then that looked local, then obviously that is a sufficient condition for the theory to be local by this definition of locality. Okay, so, um, so let me uh, now sort of give you a feeling as to why locality leads to factorization. So locality leads to factorization. So here, I'm, the term factorization is different than you would learn, say, when you're learning about scattering amplitudes and how scattering amplitudes factorize, although they are certainly very much connected. And in fact, um, uh, there is an effective field theory of high energy scattering called the SCET, which is another topic we could have discussed uh, in the context of scattering amplitudes, where um, locality uh, and uh, factorization, I should say, in the sense of scattering amplitudes and factorization in the sense of separating IR and UV are in fact uh, systematized. So there is a relationship between the two. Okay, so I'm gonna discuss what I'm gonna do here is just so you can get a feeling for how locality plays a role and um, then how it will naturally lead into our next effective field theory. I'm gonna talk about a very rudimentary example, which you're all very familiar with, and that is particle mechanics. So let me consider <coughs> uh, two, two masses connected by springs. And we're gonna have a hierarchy in the uh, spring, cup, uh, spring uh, coefficients. So KUV is going to be much stiffer than KIR. And <clears throat> I want to study the motion of the system at wavelengths much um, or frequencies much less than KUV over M. Okay. So, well, we can know, we know how to do, we solve this system exactly. We can decompose into normal modes. And there are two normal modes. There's one with frequency uh, K, um, oops, sorry. And there's another one with frequency Okay. So this is a, a very high frequency and this is a uh, relatively low frequency. So if we're interested at very low frequencies, we will only um, uh, see this, uh, uh, this low energy mode and notice that it's independent of KUV. So the long distance physics is actually completely blind to the UV physics, right? 
not completely true, and let's let's see why. Okay, uh, it's true in this case because we're only considering um, the the free theory. There are no interactions in the sense that there are no nonlinearities. So let's introduce nonlinearities, and then the UV will bleed into the IR. Okay. Now, I should say I'm going to introduce nonlinearities in a completely ad hoc fashion. If I were to do this properly, I would have to discuss the symmetries of phonons. These are basically acoustic uh, uh, oscillations. Um, and I'm not going to try to, to mimic the nonlinearities of the phonon problem. Um, that's a separate issue. It doesn't matter for what we're interested in. I'm just going to put in some ad hoc nonlinearities. These are not the correct nonlinearities for this problem but for pedagogical reasons, they will suffice. So um, let me introduce an interaction term into the Lagrangian. And let's call it with some co co coefficient. And let me call the position of, uh, uh, of the IR, um, of the, this is UIR, and this is U, UV, or T, that is uh, the normal mode coordinates. So there's one UV normal mode coordinate and one, one IR. And I'm going to introduce a nonlinearity that looks something like that. OK? <clears throat> um, and I'm furthermore going to couple the UV mode to a forcing function. So F is some external forcing function. Okay, and I, what I want to understand is what is the IR physics look like. So I'm gonna I'm gonna force the um, the the short distance mode or short sorry short time scale mode. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna hit it. Now of course physically it would be difficult to only ping the UV mode and not ping the IR mode, but we're just looking at the mathematics here for the moment. So let's not worry about that. And let's look at the what is the response to IR. So what is the Okay, so um, so if we think about this as just a zero dimensional field theory, then we could think of uh, the, the forcing function is just like an external source. And we're interested in calculating the one point function, the amplitude of IR, the IR mode. So uh, we have a three point function, which is gonna generate a Feynman rule that looks like this. So this is uh, IR UV, UV, right? So, this is how I would calculate the one point function. So, this is F of T, this is F of T prime. And I can calculate, so this, I can write the answer for this down. <coughs> There's, these are going to be the propagators for um, th this is the UV mode. So there's two propagators, one for each UV mode and one propagator here for the IR mode. So I can write down the answer. It looks something like this. Okay, so this is one UV propagator, two UV propagators, one IR propagator with a net momentum or energy flowing is one plus two. So this is omega one, this is omega two. So that follows just from a standard Feynman diagram. 
analysis, even though this is completely classical. So strictly speaking, these propagators should not be um, should not be the Feynman propagators that you learn about in field theory because we're doing classical physics here. These should just be retarded Green's functions. Okay. Now, um, and sorry, there's an F uh, of omega one. This is the Fourier transform. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. So this is F. I've already Fourier transformed, so I shouldn't have that there anymore. It, these guys are the Fourier transforms of the forcing functions that are showing up here. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> and I still have e to the i t. So this is u i r of t, right? Um, so now we're going to assume that F has um, only has support over. Um, so this thing is zero for omega <clears throat> greater than omega uv. So it has some finite region of support and frequency space. So this integral will die off for omega of order omega uv because F is going to zero. So we can expand this thing around small omega. So this thing is gonna be d omega one, d omega two, f little omega one, f little omega two. Now here, I'm just gonna approximate the UV propagators by omega UV squared. And then I still have omega one plus omega two squared minus omega IR squared. Okay. So I've just approximated, I've dropped the frequency dependence here based on the notion that this F has no support over those frequencies, okay? Now I can um, redefine, let me call omega prime, omega one plus omega two and omega, omega one minus omega two. And then this just simplifies to Okay, so um, <clears throat> so effectively, what has happened is now this just looks like a one-point function with some new effective uh, um, source that goes like f squared. Okay, so um, and then we start and we have a omega uv to the fourth, okay? So all the uv physics can now be encapsulated by a new forcing function. Let's call it f twiddle prime, omega uv to the fourth times u i r. So this is L effective, okay? So all the uv physics is now captured in here. Uh, and this is what's known as a Wilson coefficient. In that we've completely factorized the UV from the IR <clears throat> um, in, uh, in, in, this in this low energy approximation. So now the question is, why was this possible? Is this possible for a reason? And the answer is yes, and it's due to locality. So first, let me um, start with a non-local theory and see what happens. So let's suppose the interaction were non-local.
So we would have L would look something like this. So now our forcing function would couple non-locally. So this is no longer the integral of a density, right? And I have this object, let's call it a kernel of this non-locality. I've written it as a function of T minus T prime, uh, just so I can, I can uh, keep time translational invariance. The system conserves energy, okay? Um, now, so what property does K have to have in order for, um, in order for uh, uh, the theory to have this UV IR factorization? Well, um, let's suppose we know the Fourier transform of these guys. So we can write, <clears throat> so let's write this as uh, DT prime. Okay, now um, notice that if K omega is analytic around omega equals zero, then um, for low energies, I can expand Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've only kept the even powers here to preserve time reversal symmetry. Um, so if that's true, let's look at the leading term. So if omega, if K doesn't depend on omega two, so if, if I only keep K of zero, then this leads to upon integration over omega two, delta of T minus T prime. So now we had something which was non-local in time and at leading order in the low energy limit, we will end up with um, uh, a completely local theory, right? So at leading order, we're gonna get F of T, K of zero, U, U, V of T, T, T. And now this U just becomes part of the UV physics, becomes the Wilson coefficient, okay? So as long as my, um, my non-local kernel here has some scale. In other words, so notice here that this is effectively, there has to be some scale involved here. If I'm going to truncate this series, this is gonna be have to be some power series in omega squared over some other scale, at least one scale, let's call it lambda UV squared to the N. So it's a Taylor series in that expansion. And as long as that, that expansion is well defined and well behaved, um, then um, this theory will end up being local. And then once we have that, we can go through the same exercise we did before, and we will end up with a um, with a UV IR factorization. Okay. So what we've learned from this exercise is that as long as a theory is local at some scale. In other words, at this point, when I've written this down, um, I haven't told you whether or not K has a well-defined expansion around omega. If it does not, then the, U, the IR physics will not decouple from the UV physics, okay? And in fact, non-local theories, which have no scale, no non-locality, no scale of locality. In other words, there's no expansion around small omega. That theory will, is actually not even well-defined classical theory. And there's something called Ostrogradsky's theorem. And if we, if there's interest, we can discuss this in the discussion session, which explicitly shows how uh, non-local theories fail. 
Now, you have to be very careful because, so for instance, well, string theory is a non-local theory, right? Because strings don't interact at a point. Um, at long distances, they are, um, um, they, they reduce to, they have a locality scale, right? So just as long compared to the size of the string, it starts to look like a local field theory. And of course, string theory itself is a first quantized string theory, I should say, is a local theory of strings. Uh, what is non-local is string world uh, string um, field theory, and um, there are issues in string field theory which um, which I'm I'm don't know anything about. I was going to say I'm not an expert. Um, I only know of the criticisms of string uh, field theory um, and its non the non-local nature of its interactions. And if people are interested, I can at least point you to the literature. Although I I am not familiar with I. I couldn't explain it to you. You'll have to figure it out for yourself. Okay. Um, good. So uh, just to quickly review, and then maybe we'll take a five minute break before going on to the next set, uh, next topic. So uh, we started off with um, with a theory with UV and IR degrees of freedom, and uh, at uh, low energies for omega much, much less than omega UV, we ended up with um, a theory of IR degrees of freedom only. And um, in principle, um, there's going to be, because we're doing an expansion in omega over omega UV, and we only kept the leading term, there's also going to be terms that depend on higher derivatives of, uh, of the IR. And these are going to be suppressed by omega uv squared. And if you include non-linearities, non you could go on with this exercise and uh, actually write down the low energy theory of the, of the spring um, as an expansion in one over omega uv. Okay. So our next goal will be to um, apply these ideas to solve the problem of binary in spirals. So let's um, let's take a five minute pause here, and um, then we'll we'll start um, on that next topic. Okay. Okay. So um, so um, we're interested in the problem of a binary in spiral. So um, eventually we're going to we're going to do gravity. I'm going to start off, in fact, by doing electrodynamics because it's simpler, and then we'll gener generalize to uh, gravity. But at least let me tell you what the problem is, um, especially for those of you who may not be familiar with LIGO physics. So the primary um, target of LIGO is to study binary in spirals, um, mostly of black holes, um, but some neutron stars. And so what you want to measure is um, you want to measure the power and the, uh, the frequency and the amplitude in the gravitational waves at LIGO um, and Virgo and all the other uh, detectors. Um, of course, you've probably heard multiple talks on this. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the phenomenology. It's obviously a brand new field of science in the sense that it only started five years ago from, uh, of course, it took 40 years to build a machine, but in terms of taking data, um, it only started five years ago. So we're still trying to really figure out how to calculate. So the idea is um, from the signal, you'd like to be able to figure out, you know, was it a black hole? Was it a neutron star? Was it a, an axion star? Um, what was the mass? What was the spin? Um, and to me, what I'm interested in um, is learning about the internal structure of these objects. Um, so understanding uh, neutron stars and black holes and black hole, we'll talk a little bit about some fascinating aspects of the internal structure of black holes that you can learn from, um, from, these problem, from solving this problem. So why is this a problem in, in effective field theory? 
or why I should say, why is effective field theory such a useful tool to study this problem? Uh, and the answer is, is because it's a problem of multiple scales. So um, the size, the typical size of the object R is um, before the binary coalescence, of course, before they get too close to each other, uh, is much less than R. And the wavelength of the radiation is going to be R uh, over V. So now we're going to study. So the early stage of the in spiral, the system is moving non-relativistically, and that allows us to study it analytically. At late stages, it's moving relativistically, and um, you have to use um, numerical relativity. But in early stages, when the velocity is small, the curvature of spacetime is small. So we can expand around Minkowski space, um, and that allows us to calculate in a closed, in closed form. Uh, in general, you can try to calculate around curved spaces as well, but the propagators don't have closed form solutions, and therefore, in the end, you still have to do things numerically, at least to some degree. Okay, so we have this hierarchy of scales. And if you try to solve this problem, even in electrodynamics, this is a remarkably complex problem. Right. I want to track the motion. Let's suppose these two, these are charged spheres, and I want to track the motion of these of this balanced state of charge of charged spheres. Uh, well, why is this such a hard problem? Well, even in electrodynamics, this electrodynamics is Gaussian. If I ignore nonlinearities, um, which in some sense I can't, but even let me ignore nonlinearities, um, you say, well, this is Gaussian and it's solvable. And the answer is or that, I mean, I shouldn't say not the answer, but the, that is a false statement uh, because um, what happens is, is that as they come closer to each other, they will start to deform because they're not point particles. And as they deform, the force will change between them. There'll now be a dipole force. And as they deform, they'll start to rotate. And as they deform, they will heat up. Okay, I mean, I'm, just measure, I'm just mentioning a few of the effects that you need to account for. There's internal friction, there's um, tidal deformability, there's also the radiation reaction force. So when this guy radiates, right, it induces a uh, radiation reaction force that changes the equation of motion, which then changes the deformability, which changes the, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated feedback system. So um, we kind of have no hope of, uh, of solving it uh, analytically and even numerically in electrodynamics, I'm not sure uh, how tractable it is. So, um, but by parsing the problem in this way, by treating one scale at a time, we divide and conquer and solve the problem in a systematic expansion in the ratios of these scales, okay? So um, how do we go about doing that? Well, the same way we approach the problem of the um, of the particles on masses, we we integrate out the ultraviolet degrees of freedom. That's I'm using the term integrate out. That means eliminate it by um, uh, performing a, a, an expansion in the inverse powers of the uh, short distance scale. So our first stage, uh, so we're going we're gonna to see, we're going to solve this problem by breaking up to three stages. And at each stage we're going to integrate out, we're going to remove the degrees of freedom at short distances one at a time. <coughs> so the first stage is, is we're going to remove all degrees of freedom with K uh, less than one over R. So this is the internal dynamics of the spheres. Okay, so um, at very long distances, the, uh, the sphere becomes point-like and um, we can write down an action. So we write down an action for a point particle. And uh, the rule is to write down every term which is allowed because as we know in general, anything which can happen will happen. So any term which is allowed by the symmetries. So all terms allowed by symmetries. So 
So we have to enumerate the symmetries. Well, what are the symmetries? One is Lorentz invariance. We're going to uh, allow the system to be relativistic. Eventually, we're going to take the non-relativistic limit. But at this stage, we're not going to do that, mainly because there's no reason to. We only take approximations when it's necessary. The second one is reparameterization variance. So we're going to uh, we're going to um, describe the system by a world line. So there's some x each particle, lambda x i, traverses some world line. So this is this is x i of lambda. And lambda is some affine parameter that parameterizes the the particle as it traverses the world line and. We should be free to parameterize that line any way we wish, and that is reparameterization variance. So we should all be able to take lambda goes to lambda prime of lambda, and the physics should be unchanged. And the third is, of course, gauge invariance. <laughs> okay. Um, and our expansion parameter. will be R over R, where R is the external distance scale we're looking at. So I used R to be, um, to denote the, the size of the orbit, which for, the, for this, for this uh, um, is, is, is fine. It is, we're basically gonna do an expansion in powers of big R over whatever distance scale we're probing the system, okay? Okay, so we know how to write down the, the action for a point particle. Okay, so that's the part, point particle action that you're all familiar with from your mechanic classes. We could do this in a curved space by changing, instead of eta here is the flat metric. But if we wish, we could replace it, of course, by g mu of x, which would just make it a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we're not going to bother with that. When we get to gravity, of course, we'll have to allow for that. Now we have to include the interaction Um, so each particle has charge QI. There should be I's here, sorry. Uh, and it interacts with um, the electromagnetic field on the world line. Um, and this is gauge invariant because if you perform a gauge transformation, you'll see that it changes by total derivative. So that's, that's the first thing that's allowed by gauge invariance. Okay, so notice here that there's no, this is just the action for a point particle. If we wanna include finite size effects, which will become very important when we talk about the case the gravitational case, because that's really, to me, is the most interesting part of what we're going to learn from LIGO. Um, so finite size effects. What we have to do is write down all possible terms in the action, which are consistent with our symmetries. So one thing we could write down would be F squared. That's gauge invariant and Lorentz invariant. We could write down V dot F squared, where V is X dot. Okay. Now we have to put some arbitrary coefficients here. Let's call this C1 and we'll call this C2. Let's call this S finite size. And we have to make sure this thing is, um, is invariant under reparameterizations. And so the way we can do that 
is by multiplying by proper powers of v squared. And you can check for yourself now just by using the chain rule that um, this is invariant under um, a trans this uh, RPI transformation. Okay, so um, we now we can use dimensional analysis to figure out how C1 and C2 scales. So working in our in our units <coughs> in our particle physics units. Um, then you can see that C1 has to scale like mass one over mass cubed. So it has to scale like R cubed. And C2 also scales, oops. Okay, so F has derivatives in it. So the derivative is a stand in for some uh, energy scale for some scale which we're probing so we could see if these are going to be expansions in the small r they're going to start off like a uh, big r cubed okay so these are going to be power suppressed by powers of big r over little r cubed we could allow for nonlinearities. So for instance, we could write down f to the fourth, we could write down vf squared, f squared, uh, uh, vf to the fourth. <coughs> so in general, you expect all materials to have some nonlinear response. And if you wished, you could actually include these and study the nonlinear corrections and say we can, if we allowed say for parity violation, we could even put in an F wedge F term. Um, if these say were these objects violated parity due to say the weak interaction. So you can play with all sorts of games here um, uh, and, and explore other aspects. In particular, you could you could study nonlinear optics in this way. I don't think that's been done, but uh, but it would be a fun exercise. Okay. Um, so the question is, what are C1 and C2? So we have to do a matching calculation. What do I mean by that? Well, we did that in the sense uh, in, our, uh, in our rudimentary example of the springs. And the idea is <coughs> calculate some object in the full theory. That is, in this case, it would be a full theory of a sphere using Jackson. Uh, and then match it, do the same calculation, the effective theory. And then by matching those two results, you're able to figure out what C1 and C2 are. Now, the beauty of the effective field theory approach is, is that I, when I match, I'm free to match individually. In other words, I take each sphere, I perform an experiment on it, and I figure out what C1 is. And I take the other sphere and I figure out what C2 is. And then I can put them together and allow them to interact. The other beauty of it is, is that I can, I, can, I can choose any observable I wish to extract C1 and C2. So the way what we're going to do is we're going to extract C1 and C2 by putting the system in a background field and seeing how it responds. So you can see from uh, F squared, we'll have a Feynman rule that looks like this, right? Where this is the world line. And so if I put a background field here and look for the response here, then it will be proportional to C, okay? So let me just sort of sketch out how you do this because understanding how the matching is, how to do matching is crucial. So first of all, let me change uh, my operator basis to C E, E squared plus C B, B squared. Since F and V dot F are related to E and B, in fact, you could show that C B is two C two with a minus sign and C E with minus two C one plus C two. I just did that just for convenience because you'll see it has a, a simple physical interpretation. So now what we do is we take our back, we take our gauge field and we write it as some background field plus some response. 
And basically we're doing what's known as linear response theory. So then we plug this into the action and keep the linear terms in A, in delta A. And then this gives us some effective current coupling to delta A mu, okay? So you can calculate what this delta A is just by taking this A bar plus A and sticking it into here. In my notes, I give explicit expressions for JF, JEF, okay? And now we can calculate the response. So delta A will just be the one point function here is J effective. And then you can just calculate the value of the field here by just using a propagator here, okay? And so if you do that, you find <clears throat> that delta A mu looks something like a minus CB over two pi. This is at the position Y. Okay, so this should look familiar to you uh, because in particular, you can see that A0, uh, if you have an electric dipole, we know that it looks like this. And a magnetic dipole generates a field which looks like this. So we can see that what's happening by comparing these forms, we can extract the induced dipole moments. Okay, <clears throat> so um, now by the definition of the polarizability alpha, this allows us to read off C. So the polarizability is what is the proportionality constant between P and E. Um, so CE then is nothing but two pi times the electric polarizability and CB uh, is minus two pi times the magnetic polarizability, okay? So if you know the polarizability of the sphere, then you know the Wilson coefficient. Okay, so that's an example of a matching calculation in the classical context. And quantum mechanically, it's the same thing, same idea. You calculate, you, in quantum mechanically, you might want to match a scattering amplitude, you might want to match something else, you're free to match whatever you wish to extract the, the coefficient. Okay. So that's, so now we have our action. And in principle, you could keep more terms if you wish, okay? So now stage two is, remember we have three scales. We have R, R, and uh, R over V. Remember V is much less than one. So now we've integrated out this scale. Now we need to integrate out that scale, okay? <clears throat> so what degrees of freedom are there at that scale? So, I'm going to show you that A mu has two relevant modes. There's one mode, which we're gonna call the potential mode, which has momentum scale that looks like this. And another mode, which we're gonna call the radiation mode which has energy, momentum, which feel like that. Okay, and it's, it's so I'm going to show you how this, how we should, how we know this. But physically, we can understand this. 
because the radiation we know will be have a, a wavelength on the order of the frequency of the orbit, right? So K will naturally be of order omega, which is the natural order V over R, okay? Uh, so that's the radiation. Then the potential mode is gonna be the mode responsible for the binding, which is instantaneous. And as I'll show you, in other words, um, in the small energy, in the small velocity limit, <clears throat> the interaction is instantaneous, which means that the energy is zero and the momentum will scale like one over R. And so that's just a physical motivation. This is just based on dimensional analysis. Uh, but now let's see mathematically, how do we see that? So um, I'm first gonna show you how we know that uh, this is, uh, these are the correct modes. And then what we're gonna do is, because this is the short distance mode, we're going to integrate it out in our next stage of the matching. Okay, so how do I justify the fact that the claim that there are these two modes, we're gonna decompose A into A radiation plus A potential. Okay, and how do I justify that? Well, um, if we write down the full theory, this is the exact uh, result for point particles. The, for the partition function, remember the, the theory, if I ignore, I'm ignoring the finite size effects for the moment. So the theory is Gaussian. So I could perform the Gaussian integral um, to calculate the partition function exactly. And this thing is e to the i omega j. Um, and uh, because this is just the vacuum persistence amplitude, minus infinity to infinity, this thing's gonna go like e to the minus i h t. So um, the real part of omega j will just be the energy and the imaginary part of omega j will be the width, the decay lifetime of the system, okay? So this is gonna teach us something about how much radiation is emitted because that's causing the system to decay. And this uh, will tell us the energy bound, the binding energy of the system as a function of j. Okay. Now j, remember uh, j of x, you can write as, this is for the ith particle. Okay. And uh, so if we look at the partition function with this j, then um, this w j is nothing but I'm here, I'm working in Feynman gauge. So the propagator looks like union just for simplicity. Okay, so now if I look at, so what is J of K? So J of K looks something like, um, I've chosen to parameterize lambda by t to make my life simpler. Now, we notice that in the non relativistic approximation, so in the static limit, xi becomes a constant. Then I can do the dt integral. And sets k0 to 0. Okay, so if I come back here, the leading contribution in the static limit will look like so we can see that it's going to look like that. Okay, 
<laughs> so what this is telling us is, is that k over k scales as v. Okay. So the contribution to the static potential. So what happens is, is that as if I drop k zero here, I can do the integral. And then the integral just leads to E of J is just going to be Q1, Q2 over four pi R, which is X1 minus X2. And this, this is done in the notes. So you can, um, you, can, you can look for the details there. But the point is, is that what we've learned from this is that in the static limit, there is a mode for which the energy is zero. And we're gonna call that the potential mode, right? That's this, that's this mode here. So the energy is zero. And then the momentum has to scale like the only scale in the theory, which is R. So that justifies this statement. Okay. Um, and this will contribute, as I said, uh, the potential mode generates the Coulomb potential. And the radiation mode, as we might expect, generates the um, uh, the, uh, the, the radiation, right? It, it, it's a consequence of, <clears throat> if we look at the imaginary part of W, okay? So the imaginary part is due to the rate, the modes were k squared equal to zero, and that's nothing but on shell radiation. Okay. <clears throat> so we have these two modes now in our theory, and we're going to take our theory and we're going to our field, our gauge field, and we're going to decompose it into the potential mode and the radiation mode, okay? And then we're going to perform the path integral over the radiation mode. So what does that mean? In this context, it just means integrated out. So we have some sources. We calculate the vacuum energy in the presence of those sources. And essentially that's all we've done here. So this, is, this just gives Okay, so that comes, that's integrating out this mode, all right? So I had, just to recapitulate, I had some action, which is the function of A, and I wrote this as A of P, A of R. I performed the path integral over S over A of P, and I'm gonna be left with some A of R plus some potentials, okay? Now, um, now we have to figure out what this action is. <clears throat> so as I said, the leading order potential is just gonna be uh, Q1, Q2 over R. And then there are corrections to this potential which you're, uh, which you're gonna do in your exercises. Uh, and those corrections, let me just uh, give you a little bit of hint uh, or help here. So those corrections are gonna come from expanding this propagator. So the first term is one over K squared, but then there's a K zero squared over K to the fourth term. And that's the first, that will be down by V squared because K zero scales is V. So this is a V squared correction to the potential. And that's one of the exercises in the homework assignment. Okay, so what is, so, so this is V, but we also need to know what the coupling to AR is. So, um, so at the next stage, after we've, we're integrating out the distance R, there's only one particle left. What do I mean by that? Well, we started off with this, we reduced it to this, and now we're gonna reduce it to this. 
right? Because first we worked at distances long compared to the size that led to this. Now we're looking at distances long compared to this distance. So if we coarse grain it, it's gonna to lead to one particle here, okay? So there's gonna be S radiation is gonna look like something like some coupling of our effective particle, let's call it through some operator O to the gauge field. All right, and this, we need, our job is to figure out what that is, okay? So if we ignore nonlinearities, we can do that by a simple matching procedure. So uh, we start off in the theory, in this theory here, where we still have two individual particles. We know what that action is. Now this is the radiation mode. And again, I'm parameterizing the world line by T. Okay, but now we're interested at distances large compared to the separation between the particles. Okay, so <clears throat> we can approximate the two particles as both sitting at the origin and expand around that point by performing a multiple expansion. Oops, sorry. Okay. So now I've taken these guys to approximately be sitting at the origin and I'm expanding around the origin. And now I can rewrite this. <clears throat> okay, so rewriting the components of A derivatives of A. Um, in terms of E, and there's a B field, will, which will be a B coupling as well, which will be suppressed by powers of V. So at leading order, we would only have this contribution, where P here is the effective dipole moment. So it's a function of X1 and X2. And in fact, it's QI, XI, right? just the charge times the position. Okay, so now we have our effective theory. So S is gonna be composed of the kinetic energy of the particles plus the potential of the particles. Plus this coupling P dot E plus Q A. Okay, so these guys, this, this part of the action is necessary. It's not really part of the long distance theory, but it's necessary in order to, to, to solve the equations of motion for the X's. Because once we know the equations of motion for the X's, we can plug them in here to get the radiation. Okay, so how do we calculate the radiation? Well, that's, that's easy enough. If we want to calculate, say, the power loss, then this is gonna go like the probability to emit a photon squared integrated over the photon's phase space. And then say weighted by the energy of the photon. And this here, there's a P here. This is this P. So there's gonna be a P of T, P of T prime. And if you, if you work it out, this is, the, these guys get dot into each other, which they have to by, the, by a rotational invariant. Okay, so um, 
Um, then uh, <clears throat> integrating by parts, this actually just leads to which is just the dipole loss formula. Going back to to, to uh, um, sorry, this should be K here. This is still. Going back to time, space, uh, just gives you e each k here becomes a d by dt. And uh, you have four k's, so you, that's how you can count the four derivatives. OK, so that gives you the power loss. And, uh, and you've essentially solved a very simple problem uh, using these rather uh, I don't want to say complicated. I hope this is straightforward, but just going through these steps um, to parse the problem. So we've solved a very, we've hit a very tiny nail with a very large hammer. And now next we're going to, in the next lecture, we're going to um, uh, find a bigger nail to hit, mainly a black hole and spirals. Um, so I have eight minutes left here today before I start talking about black hole in spirals. Um, and I thought I would just finish because we've already set this structure up to show you some interesting things that you could calculate, say, if you're interested in atomic physics. So let's calculate, uh, let's use this. And everything we've done here, even though it looks classical, is valid quantum mechanically. The only difference which may differ, the only difference may be the couplings, the Wilson coefficients. <laughs> so let's calculate the force between neutral atoms. We can use this system to calculate the force between neutral atoms. Okay. And uh, C E B squared plus C B B squared. And now if we want to calculate the energy of or the potential between two guys, then all we have to do is calculate the vacuum energy, which comes from this bubble. And without doing any work. If someone asks you what's the force, the quantum mechanical force between neutral atoms at long distances, you could tell, give them the answer up to a constant very easily. Why is that? <clears throat> because uh, we know that this goes like CE and CE goes like R cubed, and this goes like R cubed. So just on dimensional grounds, V of R has to go like CE1, CE2, which goes like R cubed. And then just on the dimensional grounds, r to the seventh. And that is correct, right? So we were able to determine that just purely from effective field theory. You don't know to know anything about atomic physics or just symmetries is all, all you need. So that's kind of a neat result. This is known as the Casimir Poldar force. in atomic physics. And in the notes, you can go <clears throat> through it. I actually show you how to do this calculation. And you can find that the force goes something like this. Remember, alpha E is proportional to CE. OK, now this may be troubling to you from what you learned in high school about <laughs> atomic interactions, because what happened to the van der Waals force? So you may or forgotten that the van der Waals force goes like R to the sixth, the potential. And we just said it goes like R to the seventh. So where did we go wrong? And the answer is illuminating. The answer is, is that we assumed that one over R <coughs> was much less than the energy spacing in the atom, right? So as soon as the typical wavelength here is short enough, it will excite the uh, atoms, uh, and we haven't accounted for any of the degrees of freedom uh, internal to the atom. We've integrated them out. So we can't expect to get the right result. So how do we get the, the van der Waals force? Well, we have to put those degrees of freedom back in to the theory that we integrated out. We didn't have a right 
to integrate those out. So how do we do that? So we add a term to the action, which looks like this. We need to add new degrees of freedom on the world line. <clears throat> and we're gonna add some operator, we're gonna call it P. And you could ask, well, why did I choose that? And the answer is I have to choose something which is gauge invariant and RPI and so forth. Though here I'm not worried about Lorentz invariance because we're doing atomic physics. <clears throat> Although you could include Lorentz invariance to calculate all the relativistic corrections. So now this P is some unknown operator which acts on a Hilbert space which lives on the world line. So you can think of it as, as um, some fiber over the world line. <clears throat> and this will lead to a force due to two graviton exchanges. So here there's going to be a P of T, P of T prime, and a P, let's call this P1, P1, P2 of T, P2 of T prime. And now notice that um, um, this, well, this leads to a two-point correlation function of the P's, which is unknown. That depends on the atom. But that's OK. In the spirit of effective field theories, we leave that. That's like a matching coefficient. So if you calculate this diagram, as I do in the notes, P1 and P2. And this is your Van der Waals force. Okay. Now, in order to know this coefficient, you need to give me a model. You need to tell me what the atom is, and then I need to calculate the overlaps of these wave functions. Okay. Now, what's kind of cool is now you can actually go beyond Van der Waals and do all sorts of interesting things. So for instance, <clears throat> you could calculate uh, corrections to Van der Waals. So in particular here, remember we assumed these were potentials. So we made this replacement, but as in your homework for uh, the, the corrections to Coulomb, you can keep the corrections which go like k0 squared over k to the fourth and calculate the first correction. So if you do that, as I go through the notes, you can look at it if you're interested. These same correlation functions. But now we have <clears throat> in the numerator okay so now notice it's the art of the fourth and now in the numerator we have more powers of e. So <clears throat> Remember, we're assuming that delta E R is much less than one. So um, we've got a bit of a problem here because this sum is over all the modes. Now, this is an excellent exercise in effective field theory because we seem to have a problem. Well, what's the problem? Well, we were assuming that delta E was sufficiently small, but now we're summing over all possible modes. How do we truncate those modes? This is exactly what happens in quantum field theory, right? We do loop integrals over UV divergence uh, regions where we can't trust our theory, right? So clearly there's something wrong about this result. And we might think the exact same thing in quantum field theory, right? We calculate a, a, a loop and it diverges and we think, oh, there's something wrong, right? 
no, there's not anything wrong. It's just that, that the UV physics has to be encapsulated in some expansion parameter. So just like in field theory, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna truncate the sum at lambda. We'll call this the UV cutoff. Great, that's fine. Mathematically, that makes sense. But physically, what's going on? Because now it seems like this sum is gonna depend on the cutoff, right? This is just like in field theory. You cut off an integral, you get a divergence, and now you have dependence on the, on the divergence, on the, diver, the cutoff procedure, I should say. Well, where does that cutoff, somehow that cutoff dependence has to cancel. And the way it cancels is in the Wilson coefficient. So what happens is when you cut off this, um, so remember what our action is. Okay, we still have this contribution that we had before. This contribution is coming from all the physics at very short distances. So CE now will become cutoff dependent. And the cutoff dependence in the CE will exactly cancel the cutoff dependence in the sum. And so you can develop like an RG equation for CE as a function of that cutoff, which is a, a kind of an interesting uh, exercise. Um, uh, and I think it is an excellent example of um, renormalization in the sense that <clears throat> renormalization, you know, we're taught in our field theory classes is due to infinities, blah, 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 but it's not due to infinities. It's due to ignorance of the UV, right? Every theory is finite. It's just that you don't know what the right theory is. It's the exact same thing here, right? So the point is, is that the theory is valid at low scales. You truncate it, but all that sensitivity to that truncation can be eliminated once you account for them in um, Wilson coefficients. So this is a, a good place to stop. Next time we will talk about um, black holes and in the second half of the next lecture, we'll discuss um, how to use scattering amplitudes to calculate um, phenomenologically interesting things for binary and spirals. Thanks.